Um, Michael Bracewell. Uh, well, Michael Bracewell writes. It's a more you know, writey talky person. Um, uh, he writes. He curates, and that's a thing that people are doing a lot of now. Curating. I don't. I mean, it used to be uh, that it, it was done entirely in back rooms in museums and stuff like that. But now curating happens all over the place. We can each be our own curator. He's going to describe two key interiors, two key interior photographs that he found when he was researching this wonderful book about Roxy Music. And his new book, he tells me, is called On Art. That's 1983 to 2013. Michael. <clears throat> Hello. Um, right. We were all asked, as Ben said, to give a, a slide um, about an interior that had, in some ways, had an effect on us. And in the general cyclone of the week, I just sort of thought interior had an effect on me and sent this. Um, <coughs> this, uh, just briefly, it got nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Oh, it's. Um, that is a cardiac operating theatre. Um, and uh, on the evening of September the 15th, 2008, um, I technically died in one of these. Um, and it was the evening, coincidentally, that Damien made 111 million plus with his sale at Sotheby's called Beautiful Inside My Head Forever. And so the two things sort of coincided. And I'd written the introduction to Damien's sale catalogue and then died. And nothing <laughs> was really the same afterwards. So that had an effect on me, shall we say. Um, but um, as Peter mentioned, for some reason uh, in 1997, um, I decided against all wisdom and financial better judgment to devote a ridiculous amount of time um, trying to research how the art rock group Roxy Music formed. And I'd been prompted to do this because I'd done a kind of very general piece for the Guardian newspaper um, to celebrate the release of the first Roxy Music album. And when I was talking uh, to Brian Eno specifically, um, you know, this question arose that Peter just touched on about, you know, when the band became famous, um, that, you know, about their love affairs, their private lives, the, all the rest of it. And Eno said, you know, sad to say, the story of Roxy Music, once we actually got together, is incredibly boring. It, it was studio, tour, hotel room, studio, tour, hotel room, time off, promote. And he said there wasn't really any mucky stuff anyway. You know, they were all nice sort of art student types. And, you know, it, it, it was probably more like going to a kind of, you know, speech day at Wellington or something than Woodstock. Um, but he said the interesting thing, said the interesting question is how did we all get into a room together in the first place? He said that's fascinating. And so here they are all in a room together in the first place, um, <coughs> looking every bit like a rock group should look. Um, and I was, I was thinking about... I really enjoyed Paul Gorman's talk earlier and about the King's Road, and I've been thinking a lot about the King's Road. Um, and recently I was reading or rereading an amazing book by Hugh Kenner, which is in fact um, not about pop music at all. It's about Wyndham Lewis and Ezra Pound and what became known as the Great London Vortex, um, this moment in British modernism which conflated a lot of European and American ideas into an extraordinary synthesis that affected everything um, from poetry to design to music, but was almost like a, a, an, an aesthetic cult in its own right. 
And Kenner begins his book with the most beautiful sentence. Um, and it's about the King's Road um, in Chelsea. He says, towards the evening of a gone world, the light of its last summer pouring into a Chelsea street found and suffused the red waistcoat of Henry James, Lord of Decorum, on promenade, exposing his Boston niece to the tone of things. I think it's an absolutely beautifully written sentence, and it's about a moment towards 1900 when Henry James, as said, was walking down the King's Road, which had become this place, certainly in the 19th century, which was almost consecrated to the idea of art-directed lifestyle. Um, the whole Wildean cult, the whole aesthetic movement cult, you know, to be of Chelsea, became an actual sort of label. I mean, you know, Peter York is the Mozart of social anthropology. And the, the finding of labels for things, to be a Chelsea person. John Betchman records in one of his poems that he says about when they began to make a little bit of money because his parents had this, his father had this business making um, uh, sort of uh, household uh, accoutrements, technology, ornaments, domestic ornaments. Um, and they made some money and they ended up in Chelsea. And Betchman writes this beautiful line, he said on the move, he's, um, he says, for we had friends whose friends had friends who knew Augustus John. And it was this whole idea that you were buying into you know, an arty lifestyle, you, you, the poetic interior in the early 19th century, the idea of the poetic home um, was all about you. So this idea of an art-directed lifestyle, which as Paul pointed out, I think incredibly well about the Westwood McLaren setup, has in fact got a very long history, as, as we might imagine. And in just one of those kind of useful coincidences, um, I realized that Hugh Kenner was sitting in Cambridge um, University in 1971 slash 72, writing the Pound era uh, with that gorgeous um, opening sentence at precisely the time that our subject for the morning, um, Roxy Music, were beginning to do their first gigs, um, certainly their, their first headlining gigs. Um, and Roxy Music, more than almost any other band in the 1970s, um, would come to be seen as, if you want, the house band of, for want of a better phrase, the art-directed lifestyle. Um, again, Paul spoke earlier about the bringing together within pop retail of very distinct and utterly conscious um, artistic, fine artistic influences. Um, I mean, it's, it's no surprise, for instance, that right here in the ICA, towards the end of the 1960s, I think it was 1969, there was a big exhibition held of comic book art, American comic book art, um, as the source material of pop art. Um, and this was done you know, almost coincidental with a big show at the Hayward Gallery that was called um, Pop Art Revisited. Um, and it's incredible to think that in 1969, they'd be talking about Pop Art Revisited when, you know, Pop Art had only visited for the first time, you know, kind of six or seven years earlier. Um, but the Roxy ideal was very much a precursor, um, or was certainly running in parallel, maybe, although there wasn't much love lost, I don't think, between the Roxy camp and the McLaren camp, either before uh, Roxy and McLaren became famous or, or afterwards. In fact, it was a very interesting, sort of like putting two magnets together. It doesn't quite work. Um, the Yeah, this, this notion of you're going to construct yourself. Voila. Um, when all of these lads who went on to form this band, um, you know, two of them were absolute 
dyed in the wool art students. And um, I mean, it's Brian Ferry and Brian Eno. And I once found in Eno's studio uh, the, the notebooks. He, had, he kept all his notebooks. And on the front of one of them for about 1968, it's just got scrawled across it, I was a teenage art school, um, which is a sort of self-defining slogan if ever there was one. Um, but one of the things Eno talked about, Ferry talked about, the designer who would work on the Roxy sleeves, Nick DeVille, also talked about was that when they were at art school, um, particularly for Ferry, who was um, tutored in part by Richard Hamilton, um, and Eno, who was tutored in part by Roy Ascot. So you've got two very visionary, um, quite unusual, but very much mentor um, tutors. Um, there was this I'm going to use the word post Duchampian now, but I think we're in safe company. Um, there was this post Duchampian notion floating around that art could actually exist in any medium that the artist so chose. And Nick DeVille said um, that that might even take the form of becoming a rock star that, you know, which again is something that Paul has touched on, this idea that within music, within the whole kind of erotic thrill of pop, and, you know, you could co-opt that, you could colonise it if you so chose, and if you had the skill and the talent and the originality and the vision, which was the crucial bit, um, to find artistic ends. Um, I think that this is an interesting thing and worthy of study because it's slightly in cultural studies terms like trying to split the atom. It's like trying to split the atom because of a very simple thing. Fine art, for the most part, exists as a singular form which is to do with its rarity, its exclusivity and its originality. That's what it does. You go into a gallery and you look at a painting or a sculpture or whatever it might be, and there's maybe just one of them. If you're lucky, there's maybe an artist proof. Whatever. It's to do with its rarity, its exclusivity, its uniqueness. Pop, by definition, is a mass form. It exists. It's there. You know, a simple definition of pop is that it's sex times mass production. That's sort of almost, you know, uh, exhibit A would be moment in 1956 when John Lennon first hears Little Richard. That has nothing to do with fine art. That is to do with a mass culture. So to bring those two things together quite consciously, to say I am going to import ideas which I've learned at art school, which have inspired me from looking at paintings, reading books, etc., etc., and apply them to the mass world of pop, is A, very, very difficult to pull off without looking a total cake, and B, um, is a fusion of opposites in many ways. So galloping along, there's Brian Ferry, photographed by Eric Bowman um, at a uh, swimming pool in Bel Air. Um, we can't see them in this photo, but if you look on the back sleeve of the album, you can see some Gatsby-esque figures draped around, one of whom is... Um, uh, you know, the shoe designer, um, Manalo Blahnik. Um, and when that album came out, 1973, Brian's translation of himself into a kind of constant performance was pretty much achieved. I mean, the, the image had almost sealed over the person by that point. Um, and that came out almost bang on the moment that the great Gatsby um, film was um, released. And I know an awful lot of people from those times for whom that record and Gatsby sort of became synonymous. You know, Brian sort of became Gatsby. It was this odd fusion of things. Um, briefly, um, back in Newcastle in the early 1960s, um, one of the inspirations for Brian's transformation into a whatever it was Brian became, um, a kind of full-time performance pop star, um, was this fascinating man called Mark Lancaster. 
Um, and Mark Lancaster, um, very briefly, was a gay guy from Yorkshire who um, came to study. He was Richard Hamilton's star pupil in the Department of Fine Art at, at, at Newcastle. Um, he's photographed there wearing the first leather jacket in the fine art department. Um, and everybody talks about Mark that he had the most extraordinary charisma that uh, you know, virtually everybody I interviewed for this ill-fated book that I wrote um, said, oh, but if you could have met Mark, you know, and they all sort of like, they just, their features softened, they kind of, you know, there's obviously something very, very special about this guy. And what they all came back to was that Mark was cool. Now, as we know, cool is a word thrown around so ubiquitously now that it's just irritating. It sort of ceased to mean anything, you know. At the time when this photograph was taken, outside what was described as a top-end mod boutique in Newcastle at 31 Percy Street, um, a shop called Marcus Price, um, the word cool had a very, very specific connotation, and it was one that Marcus, who owned this shop, he inherited it from his father, um, was particularly interested in endlessly mining, endlessly researching. And he actually, he had um, done national service and become very much under the influence of imported American culture in the years immediately following the Second World War. So like reading a Squire magazine. Um, and real train spotters among you might be interested to know that there was a story in a Squire magazine um, which was titled Another Time, Another Place, um, which subsequently shows up as a Brian Ferry uh, record title. But he, Marcus, had come to um, realize that Cool was, and now you're going to tell me you know this, was a term basically deriving from black American jazz term, specifically used to describe Bill Evans, who was Miles, one of Miles Davis's piano players. And um, it meant to have perfect pitch stylistically. It meant that your, your mixture of your countenance, your demeanor, your everything about you was like pitch perfect it was and it's something that you then if you think about it in that register you understand why James Dean for instance was considered cool there's a sort of there's a rightness a finesse to every gesture and can this be learned I doubt it um, but Mark Lancaster apparently had it um, and he and this shop Marcus Price exerted a, a very, very um, profound influence. This was the shop, for instance, where Richard Hamilton bought his Western rodeo shirts with the pearl popper buttons. Um, it was also the shop a little later where there's a photograph of um, Albert Goldman um, in there with Bob Dylan trying on a coat. And it had this kind of, as we all know, shops, particularly in the provinces, and I've spent a great deal of my life in the provinces, so I'm not saying this in a snobby way, they become embassies. They, they can become outposts for a sensibility. They're more than just what they sell. They are a meeting point. They're, uh, they're a badge. They're somewhere that you go that defines you. And Marcus Price, uh, at 31 Percy Street, just down from the wonderfully named Clubber Go-Go, um, was very much that sort of place. Um, whizzing along, um, that's an early artwork by Mark Lancaster. Um, Richard Hamilton set a course on the found image. Um, this was before anybody was doing anything like this. This is a bit earlier. And Mark um, found a instant coffee ad and that was his that was his project it's this thing it's to put this back in the context of the times now we sort of think well big deal you know he found whatever but then 
art students, they hadn't done that. You know, working in a fine art department was about very, very specific exercises normally that you had to do. It was very academic. It was very work intensive. To make a gesture like that, this is my art, and to be able to justify it, because Hamilton always insisted in the crits that whatever you did, you had to be able to justify it in words, took some doing. Um, and so there we have it. Cool. I'm going to whiz on because I think I know we've got to shut up. We? Um, I just want to talk about this photograph um, because this photograph was taken considerably later. This was taken in 1967. And the three people in the photograph with his back to us is Andrew Mackay, sax player and oboe player with Roxy Music, then in studying uh, music and English at Reading University. Um, the here, looking at him, is another person whom everybody would subsequently mythologize. This is the late Dr. Simon Puxley, um, who became Roxy Music's press person. And Duncan Fallowell once told me that what was interesting at the time about Simon Puxley, who, I should point out, his PhD was in pre-Raphaelite poetry, which didn't necessarily qualify him to be a kind of rock promoter <laughs> press agent. And he said that what endeared people in the music business to Simon when he was promoting Roxy Music was that he never... He said, um, of course, Simon would never be so offensive as to suggest that you might actually write something about the band, which I thought was a kind of rather lovely reverse psychology. You know, he, his, his first great press campaign, which didn't really work, was that he, he tried to advertise a group by going to a, a fellow's garden party at Merton College, Oxford. Um, and I, I, whether they got any press, I don't know. But the woman sitting to the, at the back in the shadows is Vivian Kemp, who was an amazing uh, painter um, who won lots of prizes and subsequently um, gave up her uh, painting career. But these three are a, a sort of plotting mischief. And when I talked to, Simon had sadly died by the time I, I researched this book, but certainly talking to Andy, he reinforced yet again this idea that on the one hand, yes, it was just pop music, but on the other, he said, when they were making that first record in 1971-72, they genuinely, certainly three members of the band, genuinely believed that they were applying ideas they had learned at art school to pop music. Um, it's interesting that um, uh, there's the beautiful Anthony Price, by the way. Um, he was Roxy Music's fashion designer. Um, the nice thing about Anthony was that um, when he was at fashion school, he was at the Royal College. He was one of Janie Ironside's protégés at the Royal College. And um, he didn't have much money. He was from Yorkshire, and he used to buy, get his clothes from Berman and Nathan, the theatrical costumers. And he was particularly fond of wearing like a, um, a, a full, like, swashbuckling pirate outfit as day wear, you know, with sort of top boots that sort of folded down and, you know, the whole shebang. But he was also a workaholic. And in those days, the fashion department of the Royal College was in the Cromwell Road. And he used to break in at night up the fire escape. And apparently one evening, a passing policeman flashed his <laughs> torch up towards the windows to see this very big pirate climbing up the side of the... Um, but, you know, he, he was living the dream. Um, this is um, a costume worn by Brian Eno, um, made by his girlfriend, Carol McNichol, who, again, Eno said um, that he never thought that pop music was about making music in any traditional sense. It was about creating new imaginary worlds and inviting people to join them. Um, and I suppose it was, it's this idea of the art-directed lifestyle. Um, here is a wonderful drawing by Lucy McKenzie, um, which is based on um, 
a photograph in the World of Interiors magazine um, of, I think these are Nikki Haslam's designs for the flat that Brian subsequently had at, I think that was in Redcliffe Gardens. But this same photograph had also appeared in a book by Peter York called Modern Times, um, called Brian's Interior. Um, <laughs> And uh, which I think begins with the lovely. Uh, there's a photo, one of I think beneath this the, the illustration caption is Brian shows us how it's done. Um, these so that was sort of this idea of trying to bring this stuff together. That you know ultimately, the if Roxy were the house band of the art directed lifestyle, then the art directed lifestyle would include having the art directed interior, which in turn, in the strange and peculiar world of contemporary art, the art di art made about the art directed lifestyle's interior is now being, by a generation of a small group of a younger generation of artists, along with figures like Mark Camille Chamovitz, for instance, is being re-entered re back into the gallery and so it's a rather lovely full circle you know that the um the the poetic interior um that that which was maybe implicit has become explicit um and so these little photographs um my last words i suppose because i'm interested in in history but i'm not a historian i love how kenner sums it up so he, which is the end of what I've got to say, he, he says, um, which is all of the story, like a torn papyrus. That is how the past exists. Phantomasgoric waistcoats, stray words, random things recorded. The imagination augments, metabolizes, feeding on all it has to feed on, such scraps which is kind of how I felt, I think, when going through archives and finding weird photographs of um, people at Reading University. Okay, thanks.